Welcome back, everyone. It's now 9.15. Uh, we're going to get ready to start our second session, uh, which is going to be titled Opportunities at the Intersection of Green Stormwater Infrastructure and Wealth and Workforce Development. Um, to kick off this, I mean, I want to kind of circle back to what I introduced with the last session is that, you know, one of the big pillars of equity is maximizing the community and economic benefits of water infrastructure investment. Um, you know, I think when I interpret that, it's not just what we build. Obviously, what we build can enhance communities, make them more attractive, safer, uh, more productive for the communities to live in. But I think there's really a lot of great uh, work in the space of how we build and how we maintain these facilities and getting our communities involved in that. Um, so I think this is really at the core of that work. We've seen, um, you know, more and more focus on employing, using infrastructure, not just to uh, enhance those communities, but how to employ the people that are in those communities that we're building infrastructure and, and enhancing that economic benefit of that investment. And so today we have um, with us Carrie Simpson with Urban Systems Design. Uh, Carrie is kind of a Swiss army knife. She's done a lot of different work around the area. Um, she's uh, founded the award-winning consulting firm of Urban Systems Design uh, to provide expert leadership to municipal clients um, in seeking effective public partner, private partnerships, uh, interagency coordination, community engagement to transform the built environment. Uh, she also co-founded Dirt Core uh, Green Infrastructure Job Training Program in 2015, and has currently also been directing ECOSIS organizations, uh, water quality programs, specifically the Rainwise Program and the Equinox Industrial Strength Green Infrastructure Project. Um, she's joined today by Jesse Williams, who's also with Jacobs. I know Jesse very well. Uh, Jesse is very passionate about this work as well. Um, he has 16 years of civil engineering experience that includes leading design teams for green infrastructure, CSO retrofit, stormwater conveyance. Um, and what Jesse brings to this is a full life cycle approach to the projects that he's done, including uh, developing green workforce. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn over the uh, presentation over to Jesse and Carrie. Uh, I wanna remind everybody that if you have questions, please uh, enter them into the chat line. Um, and I, at the last five to 10 minutes or so of the presentation, uh, I will uh, facilitate a quick discussion. Thank you very much. Off to you, Carrie and Jesse. Thanks, Dustin. I'm Jesse Williams with Jacobs. Dustin, can you give me a little thumbs up if you can see me and if you can hear me? I think you can, but... You got it. I hear okay, you. thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jesse with, with Jacobs, and I'll be co-presenting today with Carrie, Miss Swiss Army Knife. Uh, and... We're going to be talking today about opportunities at the intersection of green stormwater infrastructure and workforce development. As Dustin mentioned, a topic that's near and dear to both of our hearts. Uh, and we actually conceived this talk almost a year ago, maybe more. So obviously that was before pandemic and lockdown and COVID and a lot of stuff last summer. So you're going to get the new and improved version here. Uh, David, let's go to slide two if you don't mind. So uh, yeah, you know, a lot's changed. And for many of us, this last year has been the most difficult year of our lives. I mean, that's definitely true for me. Um, in the last year, our communities ha have faced unprecedented challenges with unemployment, societal upheaval, and isolation, just to name some of the biggies there. In addition, many of us have been more aware of the disproportionate impacts that this pandemic and, and other challenges have, have had on people of color and on women. Um, so Carrie and I suggest that, that restoring the Puget Sound, including through capital programs, uh, presents or represents an, an opportunity to address our current needs for job creation, racial equity, and community building. Um, so the goal of, of our talk and our discussion today is to highlight old as well as new potential opportunities to present recent, recent successes in training and mentoring and to create a space for collaboration. So uh, some, if not many, of the challenges and opportunities that are facing us might best be tackled at the regional level or, or at least um, you know, could share resources across various public agencies and NGOs. So we hope to, today to, to, to start and to, to continue a space for, for partners to connect and to collaborate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
bear with me. Thanks. So as, as the workforce ages, we need to recruit new staff and we must engage a broader population of recruits. Implementing a stormwater infrastructure capital program may also require a significant increase in workforce people to, to deliver the necessary infrastructure assets and to maintain them in, in, in perpetuity. Um, a challenge facing program development now is, is finding and training the workforce to deliver cost-effective quality work. Uh, but, you know, ding, ding, opportunity, uh, you know, needing to find people, needing to, to you know, to have, have more workers presents an opportunity for workforce program development to drive economic growth, to generate green jobs, to address equity, uh, and to employ the communities where infrastructure investments are located. So, um, and in particular, green infrastructure, construction, operations, maintenance, inspection, et cetera, um, th those types of, of positions could, could really be gateway positions or, or stepping, so, um, you know, stepping stone positions into, into some of the more traditional positions that have been encompassed by PNCWA, like, uh, such as wastewater operations. Next slide, please. Uh, one other opportunity that we'd like to highlight today um, is that in addition to, to Puget Sound restoration, flood control, and other traditional stormwater drivers, you know, the pandemic and the lockdown have, have um, revealed a need for new and different types of community spaces, new spaces to exercise and play, you know, new places to dine outside, those, those, those types of things, as well as different transportation options. So, we're postulating that as these temporary community spaces are made more permanent, this might be an opportunity for shared projects or partnership projects that, that, that could also incorporate stormwater treatment. So um, in particular, creating and maintaining um, a workforce to care for these new, um, these new urban spaces uh, could could create an opportunity to, to create a green benefits district. And Carrie, in a moment, is, is going to uh, talk about examples of where that's been done. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. And I think next slide, please. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, in the midst of this weird, weird year where pretty much I've just been working in isolation at home, uh, I had the privilege of working on several projects um, related to workforce development um, in the Seattle area. So one is the Seattle Public Utilities Green Stormwater Infrastructure Program. Jesse and I have been working on workforce development tasks with SPU that included launching the Rainwise Contractor Academy, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the other is continuing to work with Rainwise to, and this year really focused on skill building and kind of specific contractor development <clears throat> to help the existing contractors that are part of the Rainwise program do more projects and be able to, to increase their capacity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and then for the Dulridge CSO project, we've been talking about how do we infuse workforce development into the entire capital project. So not waiting until design or construction, but to talk about how do we increase jobs in the community, which is low income and definitely under resourced and has not had a lot of infrastructure improvements. Um, how do we increase workforce development now at, in par as part of the whole pre-design project? Um, and then I was also part of this really great regional green infrastructure uh, career, the Workforce Development and Career Pathways Coalition that was hosted by Nature Conservancy. And I'll talk more about that too. So all of those things to me kind of put this idea of workforce development front and center and having this kind of time and space to really think about how everything could work has just given me some ideas. So today we'll be sharing some of those. Um, so the biggest thing is to, to bring more people into the stormwater industry. Like Jesse said, there's a broad spectrum of opportunities. 
And now potentially in the future, near future with lots more construction and infrastructure projects happening, how do we um, help people most impacted by the COVID and other um, economic issues? How do we help people access those jobs? So, um, and provide people with meaningful work that's climate adaptive and is geared towards what we're thinking about are these resilient cities to climate change. Um, and in many low income communities right now, people just wanna have access to good paying jobs. And a lot of people have lost their job due to COVID in the hospitality and service industry. Other people are surviving on the gig economy and working at big box stores, which is a job, but it is not a family wage job necessarily. And, um, you know, and people want more meaning to have more meaningful work and have a way to contribute to their community. So this little diagram I made just is a way to think about like there's training, there's funding to do the work, and then there's the actual work. And in talking to people in community-based organizations and nonprofits, but also in the utilities, at any given time, you may not have all three legs of this stool. And so like talking to someone at the Snohomish Conservation District, they run a Veterans Conservation Corps, and they said at some points they have plenty of people that they've trained, but no work for them to do. Other times they've got way more work, but not enough trainees. So there's just constantly this like a need to stabilize the workforce and the work. So next slide, please. So in our challenge today is to think about how do we attract and retain the people who need these jobs the most into the stormwater workforce. So one success story that we can talk about today is the Rainwise Academy. And just even despite COVID, Seattle Public Utilities launched the Rainwise Academy this year, all on Zoom with some in-person COVID safe, um, socially distant in-person meetings, um, but developed this curriculum online. Um, so just to back up, the Rainwise program provides rebates to private property owners to install rain gardens or cisterns on their property to keep stormwater out of the CSO system. So in the past, um, Rainwise previous, previously has only offered a three day, what we call the Rainwise orientation, which is very quick overview. And the assumption is everyone in the room already has a contractor's license, knows how to do the work. This is just sort of checking boxes and then they can go out and do the work. We found that's totally not true, that there's so many people now who maybe they come from a landscaping end, maybe they come from a design, they're really into plants, but they've never glued PVC before. So the spectrum of skills coming to the table for Rainwise has been very wide and, and we knew that the contractors needed more help to be able to do more projects. So, so the Academy um, launched as a, a 12 week program, which was 48 hours on Zoom twice a week for a couple hours. Um, in the beginning, there were 24 applicants, 21 people made it through the program and there were 18 people who graduated. And this is a little screenshot of the, the Zoom graduation, which is like a love fest because just even with Zoom, all the people in the program had really bonded through the program. And there was just so much like tool sharing and hey, we can use my truck, let's partner on a project. Like it was very inspiring to hear, hear this. So, and to be part of that. And at, out of this, with the graduates now, we've developed this ramp, which is the Rainwise Academy mentoring program. So the graduates will now be matched up with an existing Rainwise contractor to work with them for four hours or more as needed to help them get their first projects in the ground. Um, and so we really hope that this is a way to launch some somewhat non-traditional, a lot of women, people of color, lower income people, people that have never had a contractor's license, but have a desire to make a difference. Um, and so we're hoping that this is a way to increase the workforce. And as a, you know, all these people then could then have applicable skills that can be used elsewhere. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so the other, the Rainwise Workforce Roundtable that I was part of, we met um, several times over 2020, also on Zoom, but, um, and a lot of this came up from people that had attended the Green Infrastructure Summit that is hosted by Stewardship Partners and Nature Conservancy. 
So Nature Conservancy hosted this roundtable, and it was great to have nonprofits, academics, um, business people, government people all in the same room expressing kind of concerns, frustrations, desires, ideas of what, what we perceive as a need to increase the diverse labor pool in the stormwater industry. And so the four themes that came out of it, which we really want to dig into next year and hope that some of you here today are inspired by this and want to join us. The biggest thing is, can we, or is there a desire to create a regional green infrastructure curriculum that multiple utilities and groups could buy into basically or share? Um, a regional green infrastructure clearinghouse. So if people have work or need work, that there could be a way to match people up. Do we need a green infrastructure professional organization or union? Is that a way to like increase the, the access to these jobs? And then the idea of benefit district, those regional ideas kind of down to a hyper local level. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but how um, is there a way to kind of use some ideas at the regional level and bring it to local where the needs are greatest? So next slide. Um, so for me, I was had the pleasure of meeting a woman named Kat who works for the Watershed Project down in Richmond, California, also on Zoom this year. It's just been like the year of the Zoom. Um, she is an amazing dynamic person. I wish we could have actually worked in person, but um, hopefully we will in the future be able to do that. So she's, she and I started talking about this idea of the green benefit districts, which um, it, this is just one funding model that comes from the Bay Area and, and also probably other places as well. But um, the Dog Patch and Northwest Portura Green Benefit District is one of many green benefit districts in San Francisco. And some of you, if you've lived there, the traditionally the green benefit districts focused on like Union Square and it was really focused on like street sweeping and kind of cleaning these like big public areas in San Francisco. But the Dog Patch Northwest Portrero Green Benefit District was the first to really focus on maintaining, cleaning, enhancing, and expanding open spaces and parks, parklets, gardens, sidewalk greening in this um, pretty industrial area that has a lot of freeways and like these weird little triangles of open space that have never really been taken care of. So the Green Benefit District in San Francisco, they tax property owners within a boundary and it you know, in some cases does trickle down to tenants, but the, I think the tenant cost might only be like $30 a year. So the benefit, like the cost is not exorbitant and is, is um, pays for all of that. So it pays for the training, the kind of landscape contractors, people doing the work, they actually build and maintain their own projects. So it's an exciting way to kind of target money into an area that really needs it. And then across the Bay, um, in Richmond, which is just north of Oakland. So theirs is a little different because the Richmond is a much more lower income community and has a lot more needs as far as economic development. There, they developed the Green Collar Core, which, um, and the Green Benefit District there, sorry, is paid for using um, pollution mitigation funding. There's actually, I think an oil refinery just near there and that there's been mitigation money that's been used to pay for some of these other kind of benefits in the neighborhood. So, so the Green Collar Corps uses that funding to essentially, youth are paid to conduct simple stormwater tasks or vegetation management. And then they also design and build their own projects. So this picture in the bottom right <clears throat> is like a water retention swale with plantings that's along a, a bike path, I think that's near some highways and I mean, it's just sort of an area that had been kind of neglected over a long time. So um, so they, they provide these services to the community, they raise their own grant money, they have a training core, like I said, and that those jobs then increase their capacity to do more work in their community. So for me, this, this idea of a green benefit district, I would love to see this idea come to Seattle and potentially in the neighborhood like Delridge or South Park or something like that um, to, to enhance the work that the community has been kind of doing as they can or with Department of Neighborhoods grants or et cetera. Um, so the lessons learned is just create this pipeline and start with paid stewardship for young people. Um, actually pay youth to do some of the simple stormwater tasks like raking leaves out of the storm drains, 
painting over bad graffiti, planting, tree planting, tree care, things like that. Um, and then work up towards maintenance on private property. So and I think the green benefit district model, which could be done in a lot of different ways, just provides a, an interesting way to think about how to do that. So next slide. So as we wrap up today, um, we just wanna give, give everyone kind of these challenges. We've just ended, we're about to end this terrible year or maybe amazing year, depending on how it's worked out for you. Um, and just looking ahead at the future. So, so in, we're, the ideas that have come up today include the idea of there is potentially gonna be stimulus funding or infrastructure investments in 2021. How do we connect that to workforce development and in our case, in, in this area, restoring Puget Sound and our whole Salish Sea watershed. Um, and include in all of this workforce development that includes diverse recruitment and then the wraparound services and job placement support that people need who are coming from these lower income communities who wouldn't necessarily have access to other um, job placement. Um, Another idea to think about is the S in GSI or green stormwater infrastructure can lead to a technocratic assessment of value in terms of pollutant removal, volume of mitigation, number of labor hours. So how do we consider incorporating community needs into the design and installation of these stormwater mitigation or improvement projects and listening to communities, what they actually need and aligning that for these types of projects. And for everyone here today, I think, consider your own job and your own job career tra trajectory and how you ended up where you are today. Um, who or what guided you as you were launching your career or as you made decisions to become one thing or another professionally? So what can you do within your industry to encourage the next generation? So I'm turning it back over to Jesse. Next slide, please. Thank you, Carrie. So today, uh, we don't want to just stop with us talking, but we would really like to collaborate. And so to that end, we've created a mural. I realize that's kind of the flavor of, of the month, but I'm still excited about it. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Uh oh, am I able to share, David? Are you able to unshare so that I can share? Let's try this. I'm going to share my screen. The mural is best opened in Chrome. Let me just make sure that you're all seeing this. And we'll have a chance during our networking time for everyone to join the mural. I think Jesse's just showing it now, not as a way to interact in this moment, but later when we have our. Right. Carrie, are you seeing, seeing the mural on yep. your screen? Yeah. It's coming up. Okay, so Mira, let me see if I can close the redundant uh, the redundant window here. Okay, so uh, in your post post session uh, survey email, you're going to receive a link to this mural. If you click on that link in Chrome, it's got to be Chrome. Don't do <laughs> don't do Microsoft product. Uh, you're going to get a link to this mural and you should be able to join as a visitor you shouldn't have to log in and then i'm going to click over here where it looks like an outline it's going to take me to this outline and i'm sorry that my little bar is right in the way i'm going to click on number one ideas and that's going to zoom me in there's a red one ideas and so i'm sorry that you probably here i'm going to zoom in in a moment here but what what we're trying to do with this number one is to 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 present an opportunity um, for listing challenges that you're aware of, opportunities that you're aware of, resources and gaps. And so, you know, it it could totally be that, you know, somebody from the city of wherever says, hey, I, I really need a curriculum to train my OM staff. And and you know, maybe you put that in this this challenges box in the top left. Maybe someone else and uh, I've kind of already done this to get us started, but maybe someone else uh, has noted that WSU online has, a, has an, has an O&M curriculum. Bam, we've just made a connection. We can connect your challenge with the resource and you know, maybe that's a problem. 
halfway solved. But there could be other challenges and other opportunities, excuse me, that you're aware of that we don't have a resource for. And so we're going to list that over here in, in the gaps column. So it's really easy to, to make a sticky. Either I can come up, up here to the top left and I can just, I can go duplicate. And then I can drag it to wherever I want. And I'll just type in there, my challenge. Or I could also, I could right click and I can come up to add a sticky note. And then I'm just, maybe if I could suggest, maybe <clears throat> we'll save this kind of orientation for the networking session. I want to make sure we get to some questions and then transition sure. to the next session. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm really excited by that, what you put together, Jesse and Carrie, in terms of like, let's, chance for us all to engage. I mean, I think workforce development is a space that, you know, it really takes the industry and takes us all to work together with it. So I, I encourage everybody to join that network session so that we can do that. Do you have any further wrap up that yeah, just, you guys want to go back to? Just real quick, I'm just going to note that the other part of the mural here is that if you're someone that would like to be part of this more workforce development, if you have a challenge, add, add your name and challenge here. If there's something that you can help with, I do training, you know, Put your name here, and then if you'd either like to be part of the the uh, the uh, regional collaboration or those things, go ahead and note that here. Okay, and, and I'm going to try know, to stop sharing. <laughs> and I want to encourage anybody that if you can't make the networking session, feel free to just note it in the chat line that you're interested. Raise your hand or contact Jesse or Carrie outside of um, these sessions. Um, doesn't mean it's your only opportunity to sign up. We want to capture everybody. Um, we do have a question from the group real quick um, is um, Ann McDonald from Clean Water Services. And this is a really good question, actually. Um, are green infrastructure jobs considered by community members be good or desirable jobs and why? I, I mean, I, I think in some neighborhoods, it's, it's an unknown. Um, I think in neighborhoods that lack open space and you know access to kind of green this this world that we're in right now um it's an unknown so i i think that is a good thing to consider is how how do we make these jobs sound enticing to somebody probably in you know not to be cynical but honestly the pay or the salary would probably help um help people make a decision if they're working at walmart like, is, would it be a good idea for me to, to switch to a different job? Obviously a barrier is working outside, the elements, you know, physical work. So some people that may not be interesting to them, but I think like we talked about, there's a huge spectrum of jobs. It doesn't have to be digging holes. It could be talking about it, writing, you know, materials, out, education materials. It could be doing, becoming a, a PE, helping Jesse actually do the design work that's needed in the field. So. Anyway. Yes, please. Yeah. And I like what I've heard you both talk about before is it's not, you know, moving this from just being a job to being a career. And so talking through that succession of like getting into the industry through doing the maintenance and doing something like that, but then maybe you become a business owner and, you know, it's become a contracting company or you can just go into design that there's more to, you know, that this is a first step in many other mm -hmm. uh, steps mm -hmm. in the career in green industry. Yeah. And there are, you know, temporary jobs, seasonal jobs. There's, um, you know, something you might do anyway as a succession <clears throat> step. So I think part of it is having having a bigger pick, having someone or a group like ours sort of think about how do we help people make those transitions and have the networking and contacts to actually go from being a summer like parks crew member to the next step, which might be learning how to design their own projects or something like that so that's great well great um, um we are at just about at our time limit so i want to wrap up <clears throat> excuse me for my clearing my throat um so um again i want to thank jesse and carrie for the great presentation and again encourage everybody to reach out for further discussions and that networking session that is going to be at the end of today's program um, we're going to take another five minute break and when we come back we're going to talk about um the project of the year and professional of the year. And I'm really excited for these awards. Um, and then we're also gonna do a little bit of a kind of networking event. So um, again, five minute break, we'll come back at 9.50. And uh, I believe uh, Carrie or Scott Kindred will be kicking us off at that point. So again, thank you very much for your time. It was great, great Thank session. you. Thanks everyone.